Uh, Doyle, thank you so much for that presentation. You know, one of the things I, you know, I probably imagined you were going to talk about, but I'm so excited you, you really got into, was uh, critical infrastructure, finding a way to monetize everything. And one of the first thing I have to ask is, how do you feel your grid, your CPS's grid, is prepared for any kind of summer challenges that we may have this summer? What are, what are your people telling you? How, how adequately prepared is, is your state response? Any things of that nature? Well, I would say that um, I have a, a probably a healthy perspective. Uh, as you mentioned, I cut my teeth in the industry in Florida, Hurricane Alley. Yep. So I grew up thinking about um, uh, prep, pre preparation not only for disasters, but also intense heat in the summer. And South Florida actually is a winter peaking place because there's no natural gas, so people heat with strip heating right. in their air conditioner. So, so you had these sort of uh, inefficient and bimodal balanced. peaks yeah. in the winter and the summer. So, so we have a very robust preparation. We call it seasonal readiness. So uh, the, uh, the top generation officer in the company goes through the paces with the generation group. Uh, we make sure that we have uh, spare equipment. We make sure that we have uh, a predictive and um, uh, preventative uh, maintenance schedule. Uh, we make sure that um, you know, all of our equipment is uh, sensitized uh, for cooling, um, and we make sure we have uh, our, our outages have been completed and our generation units are sort of fit to go. We do the, the same in the winter. So that's one area that's sort of a check for us. Uh, the other is, I mentioned that slide that shows that the demand is declining or to get flatlining. Yes. So we had uh, probably the, you know, we had that uh, February 2nd event of 2011, the cold event. Oh. Uh, and that summer we had almost record demand. Uh, 90 days of yeah. 100 days or 100 it, degrees. Or exactly. Over, there right? was, I think Dallas was, you know, the 90 plus days of over yeah. 101 or something crazy. Right. Uh, San Antonio was right behind it. Right. Um, so, um, so in, in that regard, um, we have um, um, seen that successive years, we not even come close to that peak, not only in San Antonio, but ERCOT wide. So there's something happening out there. I think it's a sort of a sort of amalgamation of uh, customer knowledge. They're thinking more, they're, they're monitoring I energy agree. more, uh, conservation, uh, demand response. But you also have this invisible part where, you know, when, when, when a customer buys a new refrigerator or, or stove or water heater that's high efficient, they don't call us to tell us. No. But oftentimes the demand is lower, so you have the accumulation of all this. Of course, refrigerators are somewhat different because usually when you buy a high efficient refrigerator, you put the oven in the garage for beer. So the demand. <laughs> you know actually, Texans well. <laughs> <laughs> the demand actually increases, but right, after right, right. that, but you have this this quiet effect of uh, of high, uh, more efficient appliances, customer uh, knowledge and 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 price points, yeah. uh, and usage, and hefty rebate systems that allow them rooftop solar and ceiling insulation and, and the right. like. So anyway, long with an answer, but. We're in good place. Right. Uh, we don't anticipate that this summer we'll, we'll approach 2011. We use that as kind of in our scenario. That's our worst case as scenario. As a worst case scenario. Too. So, right. So I think. I well, think not worst, uh, but it was second worst, right? Yeah. There could be worse. Right? Yeah, there could be worse. So uh, we've gotten through uh, almost most of our uh, uh, power plant outages right. uh, in good shape. We do have one big unit that has a turbo generator problem, Spruce 2 that we expect to be back May 1st. Um, that'll be in a best case scenario. But otherwise, uh, we have bought a sufficient amount of, uh, of power on the market just in case. So we have all of our contingencies, contingencies in place. And by May 1st, we will have uh, completed our seasonal readiness. So uh, <laughs> I think we'll be in good shape. Well, and, and actually that next thing of something around resilience, and I will tell you this year, you know, we have uh, Dr. Masood Amin with our thought leader of the year tomorrow night and you know some of the things that we as we are looking at this year's uh, agenda so much of it is around critical infrastructure and resilience and security yep. and I know that CPS is really looking at its AMI and MDM rollout and sort of how security of it of talk, talk to us a little bit about data monopolies sort of you know you want to you want to be a partner with your customers in terms of trans 
transparent information. You want to give them actionable information. Where's that line as far as CPS sees it, as far as uh, data that is accessible to the consumer, that is actionable, leverageable for third-party apps, yep. uh, but, but, but also is, is non-user identified, right? Yep. Is, is, is not invasive. It seems like people will give away their information and register on Facebook. But if you ask to assist yeah. them with trying to solve something for them, forget the story, you know, so. Yeah. So I'll start with the, that answer first, then I'll get to resiliency. Yeah. So, so you're right. Um, we, we have to um, portray to our customers our solemn vow uh, that we will never knowingly uh, release their personal information <laughs> and we'll do everything to prevent that. Now. Yes. Uh, it could be very advantageous for them to, to have bundled information. So, for example, uh, we work with Opower, as a lot of utilities do, and they have a portal that says, and we, we, our, our customers can go into our website now under their account to our portal that tells them, here's what your, the average use of your neighborhood, right? Yes. So, and here are, here are the best in your neighborhood. Yes. The best, most efficient users. Here's where they are. Here's the average, here's where you are. Crave that benefit. Yep, so you have a benchmark now. And oh, by the way, you call us and we'll come out and work with you to try to, to give you pointers on what we, what we have available so that you can get to the best. Yeah. So that's one case where we leverage information, but it's, it's in, in aggregate and not identifiable uh, by the individual. Now, uh, there will come a time where a third party will say, wow, can you give us information so we can start sending flyers or uh, uh, advertise our products right. to customers? Um, and that's where we're going to draw the line. I think we, we'll, we, we will still allow it in aggregate, uh, but we're not going to divulge information that might let a third party know that this home has a pool or this home has, um, you know, you know give, the, give them the detailed uh, um, uh, demand point so they'll know, well, this home must have two teenagers. Right. Uh, no, we're not going to do that. So right. we think about those things. Uh, we want to go uh, beyond what the regulation or the law says and, and get to the spirit of the intent. Because that's, a, that's one of those areas that is, it's, I like to say it's kind of like putting a wallpaper. Yeah. Um, you know, um, you got to get it right the first time. <laughs> um, you make a mistake there and it might not be hard, to, it would be very difficult to recover. Certainly impossible for a CEO to recover. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, the funny thing is, this really comes to the human cap capital component yeah. too. So CPS, I, you know, and I tell you, uh, uh, one of the first things when I moved to Texas was I heard rust and wrenches are the challenges to ERCOT, right? So it's rust on the grid and it's the wrenches that will fix it. Mm -hmm. And CPS has really led the way as far as Texas utilities replenishing its it's staff, but one of the cool things for me about that is some of the smartest people I know came out of southwestern and southeastern universities in the United States, equipped with the tools and information and resources to leverage all these technologies like GIS and, and the cascade of, of all this opportunity from all these different reams of data and to make a cascade of opportunity multipliers. And, yep. and I know you guys have, have hired on a lot of people. Tell us about sort of what CPS, how are you integrating all of that into your, those, those metrics into your larger strategic priorities? Because I know mentorship is huge for you and, and I think that's a key. How does that impact the utility of the future? Yeah, sort of so, this transition. Yeah, so it, it, I tried to portray that it's, it's vital. So I talk right. a lot about that because I think everybody forgets about it. Yeah, it's sort I agree. Of demographics plus human capital. So uh, we have put together uh, a lot of what we call tiger teams. So we bring uh, a group of, let's say, up to eight employees together from different backgrounds in the company. They have to apply, yeah. be interviewed, compete. Yes. And these teams work on projects. They work with other companies sometimes. We had a team that worked with Rackspace. Um, we had a team that worked with our solar manufacturer. So they go out and they learn different technologies. They learn, uh, they go to a place like Rackspace to see how innovation happens because yeah. Rackspace probably mimics almost a Silicon Valley type atmosphere. So for, you know, some of our employees who grew up at CPS Energy, uh, that's a neat way to see uh, what the future might look like for us. So, so we leverage a lot of those. We have a, a series called CPSU. Every year we spend the day mm -hmm. where I kick off and we bring in outside speakers to talk about uh, what goes on, how, how other places are innovating, 
Um, this year, we're going to talk about customers, yeah. uh, customer satisfaction, customer obsession, segmentation. Yeah. And it's a day, again, employees apply at random, first come, first served. We have people in there and jeans, hard hats, and plaid shirts all nice. the way up to suits and ties. It's the whole range of our, our company. So we're beginning to try to inject uh, change and, and try to suggest that we're going to have to be uh, this nimble, amorphous, non-defined, non-rigid uh, culture uh, going forward. What about so, the discomfort with that, though? There has to be temporary discomfort in that transition. Well, yeah. No utilities, there's pl yeah, plenty no, of utilities right here yeah, no, nodding no, their head with that. No, no question. Uh, it's difficult for bureaucracies. I mean, we're going to have to challenge on things like letting more employees telecommute, work yes. from home. Uh, and we've got to stretch the envelope there, and it's hard. Uh, it's it hard is. for me, you know? Yeah. You know, I, I, it's easy, up here to, easy, easy to sit up here and talk about it, but when someone says, hey, can uh, we work 410s? No. Well, <laughs> 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 you know? Um, that's usually my first impulsive response, because, right. again, I'm a part of that tribe. Right. Um, but, but when you step back and think about it, I've got to take off the shackles, uh, yeah. the, the mental shackles. That's what it's going to take. Um, so we're beginning to think very hard about that. And, and I've got to be the driver. It's, it's yeah. got to start with me. So uh, I got to make it safe um, so that the first person that, that does something like that, that says, hey, you know, we're going to, our old, whole department's going to work from home, uh, and it blows up, and sometimes it will. Um, they got to know it's safe. So I mean that very seriously. So A safe place to fail, it's, a, it's a, Exactly. Fail forward? That's exactly right. Interesting. So, so, so just between you and me and, and the people in this and room. the camera yeah yeah so so tell me what, what what do you like and dislike about working with Millennials as they enter the workforce or sort of what are you hearing from your team managers about the change that's needed at the utility to address the tanning and the gender balancing of what my generation expects out of a workplace well I, I think number one uh, I'm very proud of uh, uh, what that looks like at our leadership level. We yeah, haven't, we I haven't, noticed that. We haven't got to every level yet. In fact, our uh, general counsel is right there, uh, Carolyn <laughs> Sheldon, yep. uh, one of our senior leaders. Um, so I'm very proud at what we look like from a gender and ethnicity standpoint yeah. um, at the leadership levels. Um, and that's where it's easily controllable. But what about the millennial part of that? Well, I'm going to that. <laughs> I'm gonna get to that. Um, we're, still, we're still trying to get to every level of the organization in terms yeah. of diversity, and we're making progress. Uh, so what bothers me about millennials, one is... Uh, <laughs> oh, he's just getting right into it. Oh, yeah. so I anyway, a, so now that it is just here. <laughs> No. Uh, they're so damn smart. Oh, one. really? <laughs> um, and, uh, but, but really, I, I'm not bothered. I'm energized. I, yeah. I think they, they push an organization. Uh, the other day, I, two weeks ago, I was in a group with a... Uh, it was actually a development team. And so it was a spectrum of millenniums, millennials. Uh, one millennial and a, a Oh, guy so the graybacks and yeah. the young guys. Yeah, I, I don't and want to gals say grayback because okay. I'm, I'm one of them oh, sorry. Guy too. Sorry. Um, I got gray hair too, so I'm, it doesn't really count. But um but but she said, the millennial said, you know, um you know, I don't like I don't like people coming to my cubicle, you know, all up in my face. Why don't you just text me? Right. Uh and, he, <laughs> and text he, for fastest response. And he was like <laughs> I'm old school. I like to eyeball to eyeball. I like to talk. I like to make sure the message is received. I like to whatever. And, and so you had a mini clash of civilizations there. Right. Uh, in one little vignette. Yeah. Um, but but that's, a, that's probably a, um, a, a, uh, a depiction, a maybe a microcosm of what we're going to be facing. So uh, there's probably some way where it works for both. That if, if you know, I said, for example, if, if she is a manager, and she's uh, managing a group, a team, and a grayback, as you call them, as a member or several, talk about styles. Yes. Say, here's the style I like. Yes. Now, you tell me the style you prefer. To one another. Yes. Get so, it through. Exactly. So, I so, agree. So I'll adapt. You know, sometimes I would like to say it's like a marriage, you know. If every issue, you're only willing to go 50%, you'll never reach a chord. Yes. Sometimes I've got to go 80% because my wife can only go 20% on an issue and vice versa. So, so every issue's got to be looked at differently. So maybe there's a case where sometimes uh, she has to acknowledge that that's his style and she can adapt. And he has to acknowledge that sometimes uh, she'd rather text or if she texts him, 
text her back, don't walk in. Right. But if you originate it, maybe you walk in, or maybe you call her first, say, I'm going to visit your cubicle, your office. So it's understanding. So yeah. uh, if you can have those kinds of conversations, um, that's a big part of it. So we, we talked about just that. So um, I, I hope we're beginning to crack the code um, by having people sit down and talk. And if you, underst if you know in a predetermined way or pre-event way uh, what my preferences are, when I exhibit them, you won't be offended. Yeah. You'll know that's, he, he told me that's what he likes. Right. That's a whole different uh, perspective than it coming out of the blue. And I'm thinking, well, what does he mean by that? Why did he do that? I, I don't like that. So anyway, I don't want to belabor that. I, um, I've noticed that Austin Energy, we, we've been really pleased with the Berkman tests as far as getting them, as far as getting involved with teams, collaborating with one another, learning how different folks work. Because we really do, uh, I was you know, with Austin Energy for the last two years, and we saw so many balancing of groups with the young and, and experienced, and it was really encouraging. There are three things I need to ask you because I'm just interested, and we have time for about two or three questions from the audience. Um, but first, rent the roof. CPS Energy. I had not heard anyone take this approach yet. Would you mind explaining to the audience and yeah. and not only not only where it's impactful for public power, but but what this what problem does this solve yeah. for you as a utility, but also for the consumer. So so let me describe the typical uh, solar build out for us right now. So we're a municipal, so we right. don't we don't Sorry. have yeah. we're not privy to. Uh, federal subsidies. Right. So when a solar farm is built, it's built for us. Our partner owns it, uh, we buy the energy. So we offer them 30 years of, of a contract from an ironclad uh, high credit rating entity that they can take that, collateralize it, monetize it, so it's very valuable. In return, we say, you sell us the, the energy. So uh, your typical partner, goes out, finds some land, uh, they, they, you know, they talk to some, a rancher who owns the land and says, hey, we'll lease this land for 40 years, and they're off building that solar farm. Uh, and it's interconnected to us, and we buy the energy. The yep. Electrons flow. Uh, now, uh, when the, the consumer invests in solar, rooftop solar, uh, they are privy to federal rebates, subsidies, uh, along with CPS energy subsidies. <laughs> But in general, for the average size home, by the time they get through the subsidies, um, they're still going to be $8,000 out of pocket, roughly right. or more, for this solar roof. Now, there are many people that can't afford that capital investment. So as you can imagine, it started out where most of these solar locations were clustered around high income zip codes. And, and, and that's been, yeah. that has been a, yeah. it is not power to the people, it yeah. is power to the wealthy, right? Yeah. That so, has been what I've always heard people yeah. say. So, so uh, anyway, I'd, I'd rather not attach a sort of political or ideological right. no, no, to it. Yep. Well, let's just say that a, a wide range of our customers are not privy to uh, something like rooftop solar. Right. So, um, so with this rooftop, uh, what do you call it? You call it rent the I roof? I called it rent the roof because, I mean, in, in like a muni, you... Roof? <laughs> um, that's what but, I was thinking. But, but, but you, can't, you can't own yeah. the solar on your so, roof so, when you're in a muni. As a yeah, so let me, so let me finish. So what we're saying now is we put an RFP for one megawatt of uh, a solar expansion. So we said to a developer, you can build out one megawatt of rooftop solar in San Antonio, but instead of paying that rancher a lease payment, pay that homeowner, uh, lease the roof from them, pay them a lease payment, you put up the solar panel, and now a low-income home can afford solar. Yes. So uh, I think we'll be the first utility in the country to do it. And that's what I thought. I, I didn't want to say that, but... Yeah. So, uh, but, but I'm happy that, uh, you know, our folks did it. Uh, I'm just the mouthpiece. It wasn't my brainchild. Was that Rayford in the team? Rayford was the prime yeah. driver behind that. One of our speakers tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, and he'll probably talk about it in more detail and probably correct everything I said that's <laughs> wrong. Um, but, but it's a way to make it, it uh, available to the masses, so to speak. Right. But, so it solves that issue for us, which is very, very important. It but is. also, I talked about needing more demand response points. You're saying so that. So every yeah. installation is another demand response point that we can use to, to weave together this mosaic that, that can be uh, monetized someday. Yeah. So, so there's a, a good benefit uh, uh, to it for us also. 
Last business case story, where do you believe energy prices are going for ERCOT, and what do you believe it means for the Texas economy? Um, I think that um, energy prices uh, will continue to be low comparative to other parts of the country for a long, long time. Long, long time. Yes. Two, two to three years or one to uh, two years? Beyond that. Beyond that. Again, okay. cool. comparative to other parts of the country. We have yeah. very low rates here. We do. Uh, prices. And I think they'll continue to be. I think, A, uh, we, have, we have the most wind in the nation. Yes. We have lower, lower barriers to entry. We're just um, starting in our solar, thanks to CPS yep. and Austin Energy. Yep. We also, Texas is very, has a, uh, a very high, uh, it's a very short peak. Yes. So peaking hours this year for Texas are very small. So you can, you can get by with uh, peakers. So the, at the point in time when we do have uh, reserve margin shrinkage, um, I think we won't have to build necessarily these newer um, uh, central station type generating stations. We can build uh, combustion turbines that can be put up in two years because we're really, in Texas, you really want to protect for the peak. Now, the wild card and all that is where does federal regulation go and does it become so onerous that it forces uh, retirements of plants that reduces supply? And then you have to get new build. Uh, but again, even if that happens here, it's likely gonna happen everywhere. So relative to other states, we're still gonna be fairly low. So I don't wanna make predictions about numbers, but I right. would easily predict that for the foreseeable future, uh, our energy prices in Texas are gonna be, uh, continue to be low relative to uh, other regions in the United States. The exception being uh, Washington State, the West Coast, where they have a lot of hydro. So a little inside baseball. Folks in Austin sometimes gripe about San Antonio and its aggressive clean tech initiatives and uh, bringing business development. They say you guys are so aggressive. You guys uh, are first in line uh, to that conversation. Uh, to me, sometimes it looks like Austin's trying to keep up with what San Antonio is doing. Um, what problem does that solve for the uh, San Antonio community? Um, and what, what does spurring clean tech, clean energy, new energy solutions mean for your community? I got a chance to work with UTSA. I got to see it yep. firsthand. Eddie Kirby, I've, saw, I've seen the EV and NGV initiatives across your, yep. your service territory. It seems like things are moving. So, it, uh, so I think it makes, it makes us a hub of innovation. It does. And we like that. I yeah. think it's a good uh, place to be. Um, San Antonio uh, probably has... Uh, some of the some the, some traits that we're trying to prove to relative to Austin some other areas we have a relatively a lower uh, socioeconomic levels we have lower education levels in general we have higher dropout rates so uh, probably uh, in many respects maybe uh, more uh, health issues yeah so it's, it's a city where we're, we're b b striving to become top tier so the more that you can you can get flagship industries, especially that innovative high tech and have that sort of pizzazz yes. to it. It puts the seed in a good light and makes it a place where uh, people want to come to study. Uh, they want to start businesses. They want to do business there. So, so I think that's the benefit. Mm -hmm. And as you get these uh, critical masses of innovation, then comes education and the, the, you get research dollars. And yes. I mean, it just begins to to really uh, to add up into something great. And so that's really what we're striving for. So I think in a, in a short, short few sentences, that is the big benefit, uh, that it's a good branding for San Antonio because it attracts a lot of other things along with it. Man, I, I have about two more pages of questions, but I think we're holding these people up. Should we hold them up for 30 more minutes or should we let them get a drink? <laughs> well, I think we're gonna hold off on the q and you know, Are we gonna have you for a few for, a, for a, a moment down down at the courtyard, uh, I think you have quite an audience that is captured uh, by some of the things you've said. Yeah, uh, sure, I, I can stay a little bit. We love that, we love that. Everyone, help me in thanking Mr. Benneby for coming here with us tonight.